Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I have one of the godfathers of product-led uh, growth and thought leadership about product-led growth, Wes Bush here. Uh, over 500,000 people have read his book, Product That Grows, How to Build a Product That Sells Itself. And uh, you actually both read the book and listened to the podcast that he's created, Product Led. You can find a ton of resources on everything Product Led on productled.com. But today, uh, I'm one of the readers of that book. We have the resource himself, Wes Bush. Wes, welcome to the pod. Thanks so much for having me here. This is fun. Awesome. Well, Wes, I, I mean, I, I think one of the uh, reasons why our audience, you know, tunes in is we we talk a lot of, about kind of how do you create experiences, right? And experiences, mm -hmm. you know, we, we tend to focus on content experiences, but those content experiences support product-led growth. They yeah. support sales-led growth. They support, obviously, marketing growth. They support employee engagement and growth through have, enabling your team. And you yourself, you run a content-led business. You have defined the product-led category and kind of have the uh, kind of authoritative take on what does that mean. And obviously you're, you're, you're merging because these things are not like existing in mm -hmm. a vacuum, right? Like product-led sales is a combination of product-led growth, like, like the product-led and the sales-led motions. So let's yeah. define what it, what product less is today and how it's evolving, how it's spreading and the various flavors that you're seeing for our audience, because I think the definition helps us kind of take this conversation further. Yeah, no, for sure. So um, like product led growth on its own, like when I published the book about four years ago, it's like, it's when you use your product to acquire, engage, monetize users on its own. The subtitle of the book was like, how to build a product that sells itself. I thought it was like, you know, crazy. But then I was like, actually, all the best product led companies, they do that really well. Uh, so that's like at a high level, what it means to be like when you are utilizing product led growth. And when one of the kind of ideas is that, you know, when you said this engage component, right, that you're yeah. typically historically, you've been like, you sell, you find somebody, you sell them something, then after you sold them, you have to hustle and engage them, make sure they get the value yes. of the product. <laughs> and then hopefully you renew them and expand that relationship, right? That's a historical journey and it's expensive journey because you have to hire uh, either like a lot of marketing, you know, to get yeah. the leads then from inbound or outbound, you hire sales development reps, they book appointments to for the reps. And, you know, maybe at the end of the day, you end up, a customer that gets value. So you're shifting that um, sh that that equation. But one of the challenges is like the acquisition is still there, and then you need to acquire yeah. different people, right? Maybe it's the you know uh, user is like yeah, instead of ideal customer profile, ideal higher. user profile. Tell us a little bit about what are you seeing that when people are implementing um, product led strategies, what is it changing? How does it impact their marketing? to get yeah. the, the, and who are they getting? And, and so what are the dependencies around that? Yeah, so I think like the high level, it's like the biggest difference between like more of a product lab versus sales, like companies like how you sell is just as important as what you sell. And I think like we see that happening again and again, regardless if you're like a content business or you're a software business, uh, it's like people want that experience, right? That's what matters. Um, now, what you kind of outlined there is, there's like these three pillars of like any business. Every business needs to acquire people. They need to engage people, provide value. They got to monetize. Um, so the big shift when it comes to being more product led as a business is really just like you acquire people and then you engage and then you monetize. So you have to have like a really good, exceptional experience uh, when it comes to actually seeing the overall value. So like that's kind of the, the big shift and what it changes uh, back to your initial question is it changes everything because as soon as like, when you look at from your acquisition angle of like, how do I get people to my website? You start thinking about, well, what are all the problems they would have before they, they even get to find out about a software or a solution like we offer? Uh, maybe it's a content asset that we could create that would help kind of solve some of these beginner problems before they even find out about us. Uh, wouldn't that be great? 
And then when it comes to the engagement experience of like their first kind of taste test of what you do, whether it's a service, content asset, or a software solution, it's like, well, actually, um, how do we blow them away with value, uh, help them do something meaningful in their life with our kind of free option? Um, and then that's actually what we use to build trust uh, very quickly with these folks. And then when we do that, we over deliver on that experience. It becomes like a natural extension of like, actually, I could just pull up my credit card and like sign up for this full trust. I, I get it. Uh, it's delivered on its promise. And so it really de-risks everything when it comes to this purchasing experience. So um, yeah, that's kind of like how it really impacts each core area of your business. Right. And just for contrast for some of our audience that is not quite yet my transition to the product led world Let, what's the opposite of that the opposite is i somehow get to your website and then i have to uh download some white paper asset yeah. right give you the email uh, i then wait for my email you know details my company size la da 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 i wait for uh, something to download. Most of the time I get that, I will not download it because it's sort of, I'm already distracted onto the next thing and uh, I'm not, you know, I'm out, out of that mode. And then I guess I'm waiting for some sales rep to call me and then they are just a sales rep. They're not going to show me the product. They kind of yeah. will qualify me, whatever that means. So I'll have one of those probably relatively annoying discussions where they ask more questions to make sure I fit into their mold. And then eventually maybe I'll get a account executive and a, and a solution consultants demonstrating the product. If I'm a good fit on yeah. uh, some sort of a product, either PowerPoint or some sort of a product demo, but I still haven't touched the product, haven't experienced it, haven't imagined myself using it, you know, and what, what is the implications of that old uh, process? Versus the new one that you're describing, like what are you seeing? You know the business impact for the businesses that embrace the. You know, let's yeah. get into it. Let's at least feel the product. Maybe see the video demo or the interact was an interactive demo, and like start feeling it. Versus like have all these barriers before I get to experience what the product can do. Yeah, I mean, like the biggest implication is like, is that what people want? And the research shows it's not. Uh, three out of every, every four B2B buyers would rather sign up for like a free option versus just talking to someone in sales. So like right out of the bat, uh, you're going to notice like 20 to 30% more people like signing up for your free product versus a demo. Why? It's not because it just sounds better. Well, it's because it's like what people want. Um, and back to like some of the core differences, it's like, well, on a product led company, you show the value. You have to showcase it. Uh, and you build trust that way by actually delivering on your promise, whatever you told people in the sales ad circumstance, it's like more about, I'm going to tell you, um, hopefully you're going to be able to kind of read between the lines of how this would work for your product. They're, they're great at sales. Um, but that's, that's one of the, the big differences is product led is all about showing the value really upfront, being transparent fully about everything. Uh, whereas a lot of that sales experience is is not transparent a lot of times too when it comes to like pricing and oh yeah how much is this going to cost me kind of thing um and so the big question to always ask yourself if you're like sales led right now and you're thinking about okay like how do we go from here is to really think about like is your salesperson adding value or friction if it's adding just friction it's like you could probably remove it um, at that stage uh, so always think about like that question and that will kind of like allow you to simplify because a lot of times when you're early in your industry, like right now, productled.com, like we're early in our journey. A lot of people are still learning about what product led is, is it right for their business or not? So we actually, although we advocate product led, we have what you would call a glorified sales call. Why? Because we add a ton of value. When it comes to that, we help people sort through if this strategy is right for them. We help them make big decisions when it comes to their entire go-to-market motion. So it's- so It's like you have really a decision bad. journey that you take people on in yeah. your call because the, the whole notion of product-led is still relatively in the early phase totally. of understanding. It's not like yeah. a mature, you, but you don't need to do a product uh, 
education call to do Zoom at this point because that has been no, around. Yeah. Everybody, it's a mat relatively mature category, and then COVID made it more mature. If if it was if it wasn't, even though there are people right. competing, selling enterprisey versions of Zoom with sales call folks uh, at the beginning of the video conferencing yeah. journey. So what you're saying is, as the category matures, it may have more room to be product led. Uh, because totally. it's already well known. Yeah, it's usually not even a question of like, uh, should we be product led? It's like when, because like every category, if you have a great market, uh, it's going to mature, saturate, get a lot of competition. And when that happens, what go to market motion do you want? Do you want the most scalable one, the one where you can scale the easiest, fastest, uh, or do you want the more inefficient one? Uh, which is usually the sales led one where it's it's easier to get started in business with a sales led motion, but it's way harder to scale, a lot more expensive to scale because it's like hiring a lot more salespeople to kind of scale up that motion versus product led motion. It's like on the inverse, it's like, it's really hard to kind of get started, get right. Um, but it becomes infinitely easier when you are scaling it up. And so let's dig in. Why is it hard? Right, because once so you brought up, you have to. It's a immature category, so you need to yeah. help people define the problem. Right, is that that sort yeah. of they don't have the problem sure. set in their head. Um, one thing that we see, and I'm wondering if you're seeing that, is that people start creating, uh, at least using was was real, some relate to customers are creating this sort of decision, you know, self guided journeys, and yeah. those are interesting because they're still pretty complex. Right. There's a lot of options, right? Like you have a lot of business goals, right? But it sort of captures three or four main goals that you would have, let's say, as a marketer uh, mm -hmm. in in that company's ecosystem. You know, that you would then choose, choose like click that adventure that along with one of those yeah. goals, and then you will drill into this. And so if the company scales, if it has maturity, it could create content that mimics some of the conversations I think that you're describing. But if yeah. you don't know what that content is at the beginning, right? It's very hard oh. to remember. Like, you know, if you don't know that con what's the right conversation, then you're going to be just kind of trying to automate something that's not yet ready to be automated. Is that kind of? Yeah, no, that's yeah. exactly it. So like a lot of times in those like sales calls, you you just kind of look out for like, what are some of the recurring things that people have? Uh, like one of them for us is like, uh, we use this in the qualification, like what are your qualification kind of questions are really important as far as like that content journey, because it's like, if this person isn't hundred percent convinced product led is right for them, we can't sell them anything. We should not sell them right. <laughs> uh, because it's like, okay, we, we have to start there, um, getting them to understand how to think through this and see if it's actually right for them. And so back to that content journey, that's actually what we're working on now. It's like part of even applying for some of these calls is like, oh, okay, great. We actually recommend starting here. Uh, this content asset will help you think through this big decision um, so you can get a lot more clarity on that. So absolutely, um, I'm all for that. And I think there's really great ways you can do that with content to kind of accelerate that and make sure that if you do talk to some of these people, they are uh, kind of vetted and they understand like what are some of those big kind of decisions they have to make before they even make sense to use your product. The problem that we see, and this is sort of maybe back to kind of what's the underlying idea of uh, product led is that you want people to ex start experiencing the value, start engaging with the ideas, right? So you can't bore somebody yeah. with your book on product led growth, right? No. Like you have to <laughs> make it be exciting, make it feel like it's a yeah. product and right. Like, and I think it's sort of ironic that I think some companies have maybe a good product right like an actually like let's say have a great product but in the when it comes to educating which is the first step as you said like hey let me learn about the problem i don't know if i you know how to think about that problem so in the yeah. process of framing that they tend to fail because they they're still using maybe old school marketing techniques that are not worthy of their product or worthy of the kind of getting okay. the mind share for customers what are you seeing like if you're if you're playing product led game, you can't get away with that anymore, right? Because if you're like selling some Soviet era UX, fine, right? You could hide that, you know, behind complexity up front. 
But if you're like, if you're complex to even understand what you're doing and you're saying my product right. is very simple, <laughs> you can you know, go try it. You're kind yeah. of losing people before they even get started. Do you see like these sort of embarrassing mess ups that are happening where maybe marketing is still operating on the old paradigm, but product team is operating on the newer paradigm and they're just like not aligned? You know, oh, or do you totally. see the opposite, yeah. right? Do you see people really get it? Like what's what, you know, you're observer of most innovation in this area Th your thoughts yeah no i see this a lot where it's like okay um i, I still remember i think the worst instance of this was marketo <laughs> i remember i was on marketo's website uh, this was about eight years ago i was like wow this thing's slick like best website i've seen at this time um and then we purchased this product i was working at vidyard and i just remember going into this product i was like what the like is this the same company even like <laughs> it, it was just like really clunky, powerful, clunky as hell. Uh, so like that was a definitely like a shell shock, but that was a sales led experience. So they were able to get away with that because they were selling to my boss, who was the VP of demand generation. Now I was just the user and the one going to use it uh, in the company. So that was an instance where I was just kind of like, oh, I guess this is what we're using. Now in a product led world, that that doesn't fly anymore because I'm the one testing out what are some of these tools and I'm going to recommend it to whoever my boss is, or if I'm the CEO, I'm just going to make that decision and be like, okay, yeah, we're going to use this tool. Uh, so it has to be easy to use. And back to why this is so important, um, I'll ask you a question. What did you do the last time you downloaded an app on your phone and you couldn't get the value. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, we ignore it. That's the yeah. shortest. That's the shortest answer. I mean, the apps. That's one mm -hmm. of the reasons why. We, so, first of all, the apps is generally like, you know, harder <laughs> because like who has oh, the yeah. bandwidth to download an app? But like, I think but one of the most, you know, the, there's another type of download that we see all the time, which is the. Um, sort of the reason we started relate to them, but I think it sort of tells it's, it's aligns with what you're describing. So basically people are paying ads to yeah. get, get me to discover, download some kind of content asset, right. Uh, yeah. Or they are investing a lot of money into outbound kind of outreach to get me exposed to that asset, or they are, um, you know, paying for some events to get again exposure to to this after event or something like that. So there's like they're they're investing in either content that leads to the product or some sort of content that educates about the problem. I I let's say I download it. It takes me out of a web form into a Adobe Acrobat format, and then I have like. The way it's set up, I'm like immediately like shrinks the format of the PDF to like a tiny part of the page. Uh, yeah. And it's like, it's this sort of like really low font thing. You know, it kind of completely takes me out of my flow. And I try to click on something. It's not clickable, like a web experience. And I'm like, okay, whatever, I forget. And that was sort of our aha. That's like, if that's my first impression, totally. you know, I'm, I'm already gone. Like, I don't care about how yeah. easy your product is. I'm like, I'm already like underwhelmed by your very top of the funnel investment, which, which is expensive. And then the same thing back to your stories. Like, let's say I have a complex product, right? Like, say so not everybody yeah. can get away from this, but I want to be more product. Like I want to have virality inside that account or at least positive word of mouth. So what am I going to do? Well, my my onboarding materials are just as dense as my product because if the product is complex, odds are the onboarding yeah. is also complex and I can't navigate for that or I have very partial kind of text-driven instruction, but I'm a visual person um, and I need some more context. So I think that's where we see like the, the success materials as well. Maybe you could talk about kind of the role of the, the impact of product led across the buyer journey, because obviously one mm -hmm. of the amplifiers mm -hmm. is you probably expose the total number of users uh, to, uh, you know, in, in the product led uh, companies is much larger than historically kind of niche 
you know, niche products that have a very small number of users. Is that kind of an accurate assessment or what, what are you seeing? I mean, yeah, in a lot of cases, it's like, okay, if you're product led, you should have a, a decent sized market. Um, I know like just Jason Lumpkin would always say like, oh yeah, like have like a million plus people in your market. I disagree. Like, I don't think it depends what your goal is as a business. Is it like a lifestyle biz? <laughs> is it something where it's like, okay, venture scale ready? Uh, maybe in that case, it's like, okay, yeah, for sure. Uh, we need more than a million people to make this work. But um, yeah, I don't think like too much about those numbers. It depends on what is your overall kind of outcome for that. But like back to what you're mentioning, it's like, how does it change um, the overall kind of like go to market motion? It's like that acquisition, engagement, monetization, those three pillars, it's like the engagement piece. If you don't fix that, if you don't have a really good capability around that as a company, it won't work. And it won't work because it's like people... If they don't get the value, they're just going to leave. They're going to ignore it, like you said, and never come back. And so that's really where I always say like this one quote, which is like your user success will eventually become your success uh, because they're not going to upgrade unless they have a really great experience. And so if your first impression is very, you know, so-so, it's confusing, um, you will lose people and that will be the bloodbath <laughs> of your free motion. So uh, that's something that I think when it relates to content, uh, and even what you give away for the free content and everything else like that too, uh, if you don't engage, if you don't make it engaging, then you lose. Uh, so I think that's like right now, the, the harder part is like, everybody can build products. Everybody can build content. Um, but can you truly create an engaging experience? No, that's, that's the hard part. That's the next level. <laughs> Right. And engage. So I guess what we're saying is the engaging experience, it's really across the journey. Right. And yeah. then sort of the experience it, and we have a saying experience is the message. Right. But it probably for you, it would be like experience is the product. Right. Yeah. Like on the on the product led side. Um, so let's talk about, you know, maybe, uh, you know, broader concept, uh, which is like what is this doing to the overall business model and kind of cat new category creation uh if you have this product led motion right like is there like you know the classical example actually i want to read it from your book history tells us uh that how you sell is just as important as what you sell blockbuster couldn't compete with netflix by selling same digital content you need to decide when not if you'll need to innovate in the way you sell so is you, let's talk about is product led more about innovating on the sales motion is it a combination of a sales to you know motion together with a product together with obviously go to market mm -hmm. uh supporting that sales motion right like whether it's marketing or or other yeah. kind of channels but is it also about designing a new category, right? Like, because I think what you're designing, a, you're in the category of, you know, con like niche that you own as content-led expert or sorry, product-led expert, right? We're maybe in yeah. the, we're designing a category of content-led growth, right? Could support yeah. people like you and kind of your customers could support sales-led with content. So let's talk about like this interplay between a new trend, right, around the go-to-market yeah. motion and broadly, like, are, is this chain creating completely new categories, creating new winners in the categories? What's What have you observed, especially in the success stories uh, that came out of the product-led uh, disruption? Yeah, no, for sure. So when you think about, like, the three pillars of business have not changed, uh, but right. the priority and order of them has. So engagement is now really, really important for a lot of companies. So how do you do that? How do you make it easier to engage your users? How do you understand which ones need help? How do you understand which ones, uh, you know, should like you reach out to <laughs> and yeah. uh, actually apply a bit more like uh, not pressure, but like, yeah, service, let's call it that. Uh, so each of those is its own category. I mean, there's like the product-led sales category that's coming out now, which is like, okay, how do we make it easier for people to really, um, you know, proactively find and identify those accounts? There's the analytics side that's really important, especially in the B2B space, which is like, you know what, um, you, Mixed Panel and all these other kind of like product analytics suites are great, but it's like, it's missing they something. They weren't designed, they weren't designed yeah. for that era. It was they designed were... for like B2C. 
kind of companies. And now it's like, well, actually, I want to understand the account at the account level. Now that's interesting. So that's a whole nother category of products. And then you start looking at, well, actually, uh, what else is really important? Oh, oh actually, the marketing of trigger based emails and like all that stuff is very clunky with a lot of tools down. So it's like, how do we think about um not just bombarding users with the same like 14 email sequence when they sign up for free, but we start to go through and really proactively identify, um, you know, what should we be sent out at what time based on what they have done and create more of a just in time kind of like onboarding experience versus something that is all there. And I mean, there's already some other categories like product adoption that's been kind of like there from the beginning. It's just like, now it's more important. Um, to kind of test some of these new flows and see how you can get people to value more. And then there's overall like the data infrastructure of like, how do we make mm. understanding this user more accessible? And then, I mean, the user feedback kind of stage and category um, that's getting a lot more attention and love because it's like, well, yeah, we were kind of guessing a bit more. And if you have a horizontal kind of application like you do in that case, it's like, it becomes a lot more important <laughs> To understand like who are those like users you should double down on and which one should you like not uh, kind of bother so um it's a ton of different categories uh if you will yeah and it's one of the interesting things that we're we're seeing is it requires a change in mindset yeah. um in in how, how teams are organized right so if if there was like a historically like you know there's product people there's sales people and then yeah. like you kind of joke a little bit about people who connect product and sales in like some movies that are kind of comic characters. Uh, you know, the here it feels like the nature of the teams need to be a lot more multi-dimensional, uh, meaning that um, you know, you kind of need to have a sales person who is also kind of familiar with the product familiar with the value that could be done through the through the product itself yeah. and so they they're a little bit different than a like traditional stereotype of a quarter carrying enterprise rep even the one that could do the demos much less kind of the yeah. the, the, the old traditional what are you seeing how are you seeing organizations change and this may be like probably a big part of your coaching uh yeah. of platform that you've built you know what are what are the biggest challenges in implementing these these strategies? Obviously, the new tooling we talked created yeah. a lot of opportunities. But even if you get the tooling right, the mindset must be a challenge. And um, you know, are you finding that you have to kind of just really people have to grow up in this product led world to be successful and think multi dimensionally, or are you finding that you could teach uh, some older dogs? Uh, and new, newer <laughs> new tricks, tricks. <laughs> uh, new tricks yeah. in this department. I mean, I think for me, it was like one of the reasons I read your book is like I wanted to, I, yeah. I grew up in the enterprise world. I believed in the power of the product, but I'm not sure I understood all the, you know, could easily explain it to my team. Even if I understood yeah. some of it myself, I could, it would take me too long to do it. And you did a great job of clarifying it. But even if you clarified, it doesn't mean that everybody's on board. So what are you seeing as kind of the biggest challenges in implementing the strategy or mixed hybrid strategies? Yeah. So I'll tell you from one of our customer stories as well. So like the CEO and founder of this company, he had read everything about PLG. Like he knew it really, really well. Uh, then I asked him, I'm like, hey, like, why did you like send your entire team to our training? Just wondering. Um, and he's like, well, you know what? The, the biggest thing for us is we need everybody to understand this. We need to build a common language. We need to all understand this, uh, get on the same page, but what is PLG? And then more importantly, how do we actually do it? So that was kind of the beginning when we were doing like these cohort programs. And then we realized you're like, actually there was something there when it came to teams uh, being involved in training, going through all this. It's like, because what's really going on and what you need to do in a business that's making this transition is you need to build a new capability. And how do you build a new capability? Uh, that's one. And then the second piece is like, okay, uh, it can't just be in the CEO's head as far as this new direction. It has to have that, the entire go-to-market leadership team kind of bought into this as mm -hmm. well. So it's like, there's those two things. You got to build a capability, got to have the go-to-market team alignment. Uh, so that's kind of like step one. And then step three is like, you all got to be aligned. Like this is the direction we want to go. 
Uh, and then what we kind of do, and this goes back to like our overall kind of like product-led go-to-market system and how we roll it out, uh, is you really got to focus on these nine core components of like, how do we operationalize this? And so when I initially wrote Product-Led Growth, that book, that was talking a lot about how to think about this from a product standpoint. Like, what does that look like? How do you do it uh, from a product standpoint? Now, this upcoming book and this system I'm working on is really about how do you, you know, think about the product side of this kind of business, if it's product-led, but also the company side. How do you blend right. them together? Right. Uh, so the very first thing is like, think about your vision and your strategy. How does that connect to potentially even being product-led? So a lot of like product-led companies is an example. It's like, let's think of Canva. Okay. They want to make design accessible to anyone. Okay. That's easy. Simple vision. How are you going to do that? What's the best like go-to-market motion for that? It's like product-led for sure. It kind of makes things easy. Now where kind of companies get in trouble is if your vision's vague and then it's like, well, I don't know what is the best way to do that. Um, and so getting clarity on that is really important. And then the strategy piece is second, which is like, well, how are we going to win as a business? What does that look like? Um, uh, is it winning through having the best user and customer experience? Is that it? Uh, is it winning through, I don't know, uh, like our education modes, our content, uh, experience, what are some of the core things of how we're going to win? So when you start there at the vision level, everything cascades from there. It's like, okay, great. That's our strategy. We're not even really calling it product led. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so it's basically so the yeah, yeah and I think the the actually I will say one of my pet peeves was the word product led is that it almost which because I don't think that's the way you use it because you actually want to create it it's almost user led right like it's almost like you want to create delightful experience for the user so they experience the the value yeah. right like but the branding is what it is it's product led um but the the problem is like most traditional marketing messaging is product led right it's like our product yeah. is me 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 our feature is me 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 our message <laughs> is me me I, you know we were founded in la, na, 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 and here are our headquarter pictures and da 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 so it's all this sort of self absorbed you know egocentric yeah. marketing and product tends to be a manifestation of that. And as a product marketer, I was probably guilty of that as much as anyone. So I'm looking at that. Um, and what you're saying is um, actually the way you envision it is like, uh, you know, you start with A, your mission, right? And whether your, your yeah. mission, you know, it could be product is a core part of it. It, it could be not, right? I, like maybe you could use some elements, yeah. but that sort of is one really important dimension. And then I, if I'm hearing correctly, um the the product led is not like the uh religion right like it is yeah. a it is a vehicle right we talked about different varieties different emphasis how you implement it in the b2b maybe different maybe you start with one division using product led and then migrate the rest like the way hopspot has done this right like yeah. they started with product led more on the sales side of things. And then eventually they migrated that to other parts of the business. Is that yeah. kind of what you're seeing kind of how people are structuring this, uh, like, through, like through like more vision, like, Oh, if our vision is to support all these businesses, product led is yeah. a better strategy. Let's step-by-step step move in that direction. So yes, I think like the high level, that's kind of what it is, but I think the part where, gets a bit tough for founders and like they don't think too much about this is okay so we create this strategy of like how we're going to win where are we going to play but then where it gets a lot harder uh to kind of roll out is these two next questions which is what are the capabilities we would need to have in order yeah. for this to work so let's say how we're going to win is like an amazing user customer experience now just think about like a olympic runner like, are they going to be the one like bench pressing every day because they want to have the biggest chest and the strongest chest? It's like, no, they're going to be no. running a lot. Uh, yeah. So it's like, but yet when you start to go through some of the company org charts and everything, you're like, wow, this company is really good at this one thing. Like I was just talking to a founder and there are 10 people, eight people on that team are developers. 
yet they already have a like decently converting funnel and they just don't have the marketing muscle. So it's like, oh, okay, you got really meaty legs, but <laughs> we got to even some things out yeah. here. Um, and so the capabilities is the next part. And then the last part is like, what are the strategic choices we must make? And so just like Southwest Airlines, I love this company example from a strategy perspective. It's great. It's like they specialize in point-to-point -point flights, short distances. So in order to make that work for their business, they have to be really good. Their capability is identifying the best point-to-point -point flights. And they're not going to offer meals or anything else, no frills, uh, to keep the prices low. So it's like for your business, you got to make some of those hard cuts too. Of what are we not going to do? What are we truly going to commit to? And I just find a lot of companies, even some ones that are at some great revenue numbers, they just lack a really compelling strategy uh, that is tied to where they're going to go. And the capabilities and strategic choices are just not in alignment with what they actually want to do. Yeah. So I, I think this really aligns because if you think of this sort of st st triangle of like, here's your product design. Here's yeah. your company design and maybe like broadly like category design, like product led X, right? Like product, like, yeah. you know, like that's maybe like, you know, let's, let's say whatever, whatever that is. And and if they don't, if they are like some pieces sound like they're out of joint, you know, and they're like company design is one of them. And I'll raise my hand. I maybe should have gotten your coaching earlier. We had this sort of vision <laughs> where we actually, you brought up example of Canva. I kind of love the sort of like Canva democratizes graphic design, yeah. you know, uh, Figma democratizes product design. And I was like, relate to, we're democratizing interactive content design, right? To create yeah. these great experiences. They could be coming out of Figma or coming out of uh, Canva, but we are democratizing them. And then we 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 built this really powerful platform together with some of our enter early enterprise customers it was, you know, joint collaboration, but we were the ones that were originally the big users of this. Um, right. And, you know, there was no DNA in the company of like amazing user experience designer that walks through the kind of like first time yeah. you land on it. And so that's sort of, to your point, exactly the opposite of um, kind of aligning the resources, right? And then we realized, oh my God, until we yeah. solve for our own onboarding journeys and our own things and we build that into from an area of weakness into an area of strength we're just this vision is not going to be executed because there, there's going to yeah. be like, like people are going to um not not get there and that was a painful adjustment period um so do you see right. these happen a lot because i think in a, in the course of a lifetime company tries many models right and it has to yeah. adjust as the competitive landscape changes as well um, so what are you seeing kind of that's, that facilitates ability to make these adjustments faster or slower? Mm -hmm. Is it like whole team alignment? Is it, yeah. you know, um, like real, um, you know, t signing up to your program with the broader team so that it really like signals to the team that we are making the change. Is there like one or two structural wins that you identify in as, as part of the coaching that is actually like more hey look until you do this don't like it's not yeah. even worth joining the coaching what do you find um helps people move make this with less pain yeah so i think if you're going to make this with less pain it has to be collaborative with your go-to-market team so like the way not to toot our own horn but like i've tried every other model <laughs> When yeah. it comes to the consulting thing, uh, I tried the one-on-one -on -one model. I tried like the, you know, more, your more standard consulting thing. And I'd always meet with a lot of resistance of like, oh yeah, that sounds great. But like, I got my thing here and like, you know, we're going to keep doing some of this. Maybe we'll take an idea or two. Uh, and I was like, oh, it's, why is it meeting resistance? It's because it doesn't have their buy-in. Uh, they weren't like a, a core contributor to this. And so what I found and the way we structure it is when you join, it's like every week, it's a 60 to 90 minute kind of workshop with your team, your whole go-to-market leadership team, where we go through these questions together. And so that's actually something which opens up a lot of these great ideas. And for everybody's listening, you can actually, if you want to self-implement this, this is our free model 
heads up. Okay, great. So like autoglide.com forward slash system, you can get access to like everything for doing this on your own too, if you want to give it a shot. But the, yeah, that's the structure. You go through this. Uh, we just facilitate it and make sure like by the end of the like three, four weeks for crafting your vision strategy, it's like everybody's on the same page. We've all had time to think about it. We can commit to it for the next like 12 months. And that's really what kind of drives a lot of that alignment. And then when you, as the CEO, make some of these changes, like, okay, we let go of like this person because you know what? They were like maybe a user experience designer. There was like a junior and it's like, this is like literally the way of how we're going to win. We can't have like, you know, just a junior person at this level. You can't we have B have team on the most important exactly. area for the, I got it. Yeah. So, so yeah, something that's less important in the enterprise motion becomes much more important than the product led or product led totally. sales motion. And you need to allocate, you know, talent appropriately. And so what do you see with these companies that are trying, you know, uh, to do product led sales in particular, this is sort of a very common theme Right. And, and I think it's, you know, if you have, uh, if you already have some sort of a mid-market motion, right. It, by definition, yeah. mid-market and enterprise mid-market is sort of like a good in between, right. Because it has elements of uh, sales, but you can't have too clunky of a product and uh, because just the economics may not work. So how would you recommend for companies to combine two things? Because obviously the conventional wisdom is you can't, <laughs> you know, it's too difficult. Yeah. You got to be, you know, everybody's got to be like Dropbox, kind of go very bottom up, start was a great product, and then try to expand, even though I don't think they've succeeded particularly in the, you know, enterprise-y kind of expansion yeah. when they did try it. Um, but in reality, I think a lot of a lot more companies are sort of trying to merge the, the two disciplines, yeah, especially fine. in the B2B universe. Have you seen great success stories there? No. <laughs> Here's why. Uh because I think the stage of the company matters a lot more than you think. So one, one of the reasons why we decided, that, okay, we want to focus a lot more on companies that are between six and eight figures uh, is because within that range, a company will define their go-to-market motion and everything else, the habits, the culture kind of is a reflection of that as well. So yeah, you can change it. Like I have helped some companies go from sales led to product led, uh, but it's, it's very hard. Uh, so when they're too late, it's too hard. It's too like, or Oracle has no chance, yeah. obviously, but like, you know, like, uh, well, the way Oracle would roll it out is not like, okay, the whole company's product led today, they would start off with like a very specific product and then eventually roll it up to their portfolio products. And then, okay, great. We'll try and integrate it, see what we can do. So like, yeah, the, at that scale, it's very different. Um, but yeah, for your average kind of company who's, who's probably listening here, um, what mm -hmm. I would always recommend if you're below, like, you know, at least <laughs> let's draw the line here at around like five mil, if you're below five mil, stick to one go to market motion. Because if you try and be fancy, I call it being cute. <laughs> it's like, okay. you're trying okay. to like, I, I get this all the time. So I'm recently obsessed with pickleball. And so it's like this cross between tennis and ping pong. And all the time I see some people, and I know this because I would do it too occasionally, I'm like adding fancy spin to the ball. I'm like, look at me, cool. Uh, but like, then I'm hit the net. <laughs> it's like, I always like miss or something like that. I'm like, why am I trying to be cute here? Because it's like, just get the ball over the damn net. That's how you play the game. You master the basics. Then you go get fancy. Product led sales is a fancy zone. Um, and I see a lot of companies who don't have the basics of product led they try and be cute and like, oh yeah, we do product led, we do product led sales and we do enterprise. And what's your scale? Oh, you're like still under eight figures. How's that working? You, you're trying to manage too many capabilities here to master mm. it. And so that's like the big thing where I see a lot of companies um, really struggle because they're trying to do too much and they can't actually become great at any of them. So, so that's kind of really interesting. So let's kind of dive into this. So the product led sales, and maybe it's sort of also, let's agree on what the definitions are. You could say like, Hey, the, the product could be a lead gen tactic, right? Or some portion of the, 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 the product and let's not call it freemium, but like let's some, some, some portion of the product kind of builds the confidence, creates a sense of value. And then we're still back into the sales mode, right? Like we're, we really are 
like an SM, like a mid-market sales motion. We just have one channel, which is our pro like one some or all components of our product portfolio. And we can control that. You know, it's sustainable. It gives us some um quality of product educated leads yeah. or product product led leads in addition to our content you know folks that went through our marketing automation and kind of consumed enough of our content or or folks that are just booking appointments directly right so do you think that is more scalable but where it's just one of the marketing tactics uh to you know versus you're trying to turn that you know, those folks, then they become a revenue, you have revenue expectations from them, right? Versus from your sales yeah. teams. Like, because it's <clears> sort <throat> of, it's too easy to say you can't do it all, as especially like if you're in the early stages, you kind of yeah. want some scalability, but you also need the the sales sales touch, right? To educate people. Yeah. You kind of, by the assumption, you will have a little bit of both. So what's the way to have a little bit of both that's productive versus value yeah. destroying? Well, I think, yeah, it depends what your business is at, like where your strengths are, what your traffic looks like and all those things. So I'll, I'll tell you a couple of scenarios. So like yeah. one scenario where I would say like clearly avoid it um, in both cases is like you are a sales led company, mostly just target like big enterprises, like six figure plus deals is kind of your average uh, in your contract value. And then you have on your website, like barely any leads. Uh, it's mostly just coming through like outbound. Yeah. Uh, maybe you get like five, 10 people a month or something like that. It's not a lot. And then they come to me and they're like, I want to be product led because I thought this thing, the product will sell itself. And I just want to like do it. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Okay. Red flag. No red brainer. Flag. That's a non, um, non starter. Okay. So that's yeah. not, that's pretty that obviously non -starter. non starter. Let's go to yeah. some hairier areas where like you could, yes. where it so could work more. Another one, which kind of goes to your like product led marketing example. Let's say you do have some good scale. You do have like, you know, I don't know, this random numbers like 10, 20, 30,000 kind of uniques on your site, at least per month. Uh, so you got like some things going for you already. Now you're thinking, okay, we have the sales in motion. What are some things we could add to this to kind of accelerate it? So a great example, I love the um, HubSpot website grader. It's like, okay, yeah. great. Think about all of like your ideal user and then think about all of the problems they're going to have to solve in order to be successful. Um, and then you just try and find like, are there any opportunities like that? Which is like, what would everybody need to kind of like solve one of these core problems? And what's the fastest way of doing it? Now, some of them could turn into those kind of like spinoff kind of products, which are really great marketing opportunities because it's like everybody could get the value with it pretty quickly. It gives you some great insights and data um, and it's easy to get started. So like that's a really great spot to be and because that can actually help grow your traffic as well. Um, and then maybe at a later point, um, this is what we did at Vidyard is we have like our initial kind of like enterprise, uh, you know, analytics video tool. And then we decided actually the biggest problem people have um, is just creating the video. So how do we make that easy? And so we created a simple Chrome extension and you could download it a few clicks and boom, you got a video. Somebody watched it. You get a notification. Wow, Alex, you only watched 50% of my video. What the hell? <laughs> and this was, this was cool. the, this yeah. is where you even went for different target customer, right? Cause it was like more salesperson was going to be the individual yeah. user. There's way more salespeople than there's marketers buying Vidyard enterprise totally. marketing solution. So it sort of played really nicely because it helped you get into a new, very adjacent demographic, totally. right? It didn't conflict with your core enterprise business. Yeah. And and so so the, the idea here is like, if let's say we, we relate to like just applying, we were like our main customer was a marketer and then we had a product for sales that was PLG driven. This would yeah. be like a, like a lower risk strategy provided you could kind of allocate some you know allocate the resources and you don't plan to monetize from that product and then the marketers yeah. will get exposed to it is that kind of the thought yeah. process that i'm getting that is and like i know we talked about the vision component like the first part of the product like go to market system but like this, this next two like it makes that easy and how it basically works is like the second one's all about understand who your ideal user is you basically have like this 
uh, ideal user journey, you get like your end game. What does success look like for them? Where do they start? And then you map out like hundreds or thousands of like challenges that'll get in their way. And then you bucket them where it's like, what would this kind of ideal journey look like? What's milestone one? What's milestone two for this person? Um, so in videos case, it was like milestone one is like you create a video uh, and you share it with somebody. And so milestone like three or five is like, okay, we actually implement this across all of our website from the marketing side. So you map out all of those kind of milestones. And then you, the model part, uh, the third component is all about where do you draw that free line? Where does yeah. it like actually make sense where you're like, yeah, getting this amount for free would feel like a meaningful win uh, for me. If I solve this milestone, that would be amazing. Uh, so we call that like your beginner milestone, everything uh, to get that person to value for free. Uh, so that's really kind of insightful. And that way it's not so much like debating, like, should it be a free trial? Should it be a freemium model? It's like, actually just what is the thing we're trying to accomplish What's the, here? What's the value from yeah. the strategy? And yeah, let's yeah. work backwards. Let's reverse engineer that sucker <laughs> and give them everything they need to do that. So fundamentally, and this is sort of really in line where it kind of feels like we're brothers from another mother on this. Like we we call this kind of human centric experiences. So you're kind of yeah. saying like the user is your human, right? And yeah. so you want to say like, how do you delight this this human through interaction with you in a way that supports your overall strategy? But you're focusing totally. on that versus is this two weeks freemium and this a month freemium? Is this like, <laughs> you know, is this going to mess up? This strategy or that's right. So you want to maybe separate them out so it doesn't cannibalize whatever is working, yeah. doesn't confuse and you know get your sales team mad. But like you kind of have to still start with like what is the you know it's sort of values first, right? Like how do you sure. deliver value? And I love it because it's about giving, right? In a way, it's about giving yeah. first. Now, giving was easy in the world where everybody had big VC checks, right? And and sort of, uh, and they they were <laughs> VCs yeah. were really eager that you could spend them to kind of show some growth potential or or some sort of maybe slightly vanity driven metrics. Let's just say yeah. the world has changed, and you know I think uh, you know let's say every like we're sold that we want to do it, we want to commit the resources to it, but you know there's this kind of but like you know it's not free. Because I'm, hey, deliver investing up front into those users. And then I also need to find the audience to over to, you know, discover the product, maybe improve my SEO mm -hmm. game, maybe community game. Those are all investments as well. So what's your take on, uh, you know, and you brought up that it's expensive to get the product led right um, up front, right? Like it's easier totally. almost to, to kind of have these conversations. So what have you seen, you know, let's like... I want to do it, you know, but I'm on a budget, right? I'm bootstrapped or I'm, you know, I yeah. don't want to increase my spend if I'm VC backed uh, or I'm an enterprise business and I need to prove an experiment before I go all in. Any ideas for quick wins that, that gets momentum rolling behind this strategy change? Yeah. So I think the first thing you could do is really just think about like what could be done better with the product? So when I was, uh, when we were chatting in SaaS talk, one of the talks I gave, I was like, what is the difference between a $4 million product led business with three employees versus a sales led business that has 40 employees that's at two mil. So the biggest kind of like kicker here is it's just leverage. So the product led company is leveraging the product a hell of a lot more than the sales led business. How are they doing that? Well, whenever they have an issue, they solve it with the product. Oh my goodness, we got a customer support ticket. Somebody has a problem. Let's treat that as a bug. Why did they have a problem? Why did they have to even reach out to us? <laughs> and like so question some of these friction, things. Friction, thoughtfully reducing mm -hmm. friction is a is a quick win. Okay. Totally. Yeah. So removing friction, making it easy to get to value will save your customer success, customer support folks, a lot of time, energy. Uh, so you can actually scale up, have more customers without increasing headcounts. Uh, you could start looking at, well, okay, when it comes to um, upselling, okay, maybe that's been all manual, but what could we do in the product to make that better? When people log in, okay, wow, okay, there's, I'm ready for an upgrade or something like that. Um, when it comes to where do people typically get stuck in your product? 
if you've mapped out your user journey of like a successful customer needs to do these three things, let's say, where's the one which most of them suck at? <laughs> right. And it's usually because of your product. Now, in that case, it's like, well, okay, um, if they have to go to that page, they get stuck on that page. Uh, as soon as they try and leave, boom, exit intent pop up. Hey, I want to talk to, like, can we set this up for you? Uh, it's your customer support rep. It's like, it's a simple thing in the product uh, that actually just helps your conversion rates overall because you caught them right where they were like begging for help and they love you for it. I had this happen to me when I was using um, Databox. I was trying to set up like custom scorecard for our business and I had to make this custom metric. And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not the best at Excel or like some of these things. And so I was like, ah, I don't know what to do. And boom, pop up, great. I'm going to utilize your services so you can set this up for me. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, so it was awesome. And we were able to just upgrade to the pro plan. So um, that's like how you can think about how can we be product led and really make our business more efficient. So that's like the quick wins. That's really helpful. And I think that's very actionable. And I like, I, I love this conversation. I, I've got a few takeaways for me and my team from awesome. this and and sounds like there's a new book coming out so tell us a little bit about that tell us about where can people find you again and um um you know keep consuming because i i love i love what you're doing and how you're evangelizing the category and helping everybody do it and it sounds like it's a broad range of um businesses from smaller you know startups to mid-sized startups to teams inside the enterprise guide us a little bit about how we can engage with you west yeah, done for sure. So if you just want to learn like daily kind of product-led growth tips every single day, including weekends, uh, follow me on LinkedIn, just Wes Bush. Um, but if you want to dive more into that product-led go-to-market system that I was referring to, um, that is our free model. Like we want everybody to be product-led if you can for your business. And we want to make it as easy as possible for you to do it. So the self-implementation kind of guide is free. So you just go to productled.com forward slash system. And that will get you access to everything we do, like the exact same stuff we do with our paid clients that pay us like tens of thousands of dollars every single month to just implement this inside their business. So you can get it all for free uh, and implement it inside your business. Love it. You heard it here. Content led as a tactic to get to yes. product less, uh, product led mastery. Wes, thank you so <laughs> much for coming on. Thanks for sharing the nuggets and thanks for leading the revolution in the product led uh, direction. I think, you know, it's in the name of the customer and the user that you're doing it. And we salute you and support your efforts. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alex. All right.